Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever it is you're joining us from, and welcome to today's online connector session. Uncertainty is a feature, not a bug. It is truly a pleasure to be here with all of you virtually. My name is Gailene Tobin Vanden Heuvel, and I'm the Executive Director of Western Research Parks. The connector sessions were born out of a partnership with the London Economic Development Corp with the aim of empowering innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders with the tools and knowledge needed to navigate today's dynamic business landscape. This marks our fourth connector session since its inception in September, 2023, and this is our very first virtual event. We've been fortunate to host exceptional keynote speakers at each session, including notable figures such as Thomas Osha, Sean Moffat, and Dr. Eric and today we're honored to continue that tradition. Before the presentation and introductions, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land in which we gather. As we delve into discussions about innovation and its impact on our communities, it's crucial that we recognize that Western Research Parks is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapuwak, and Attawandran peoples on lands connected with the London Township and somber treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. We understand that these treaties are marked by a commitment to the preservation of land and water. As we today stand in the scenic setting of Western research parks surrounded by woods, water, and wildlife, we heed the messages of unity and the land and water and of sustainability and preservation of our natural hab habitat. And I invite all of you, wherever you are today, to think about that as well. We recognize that this land remains home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the lands and vital contributors to our society. And we acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices endured by the indigenous peoples in Canada and we accept responsibility con to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as fostering respect relationships, respectful relationships with our indigenous communities. I ask you to move forward with a profound sense of gratitude and respect for the land and its original caretakers and strive for a future where innovation benefits all members of our community, including those who have been its stewards for generations. And now to our introduction. Our speaker today is the esteemed Dasha Krivenos. She is a CEO and a futurist from the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies. Dasha has a background in strategic risk management across multiple sectors. She firmly believes that managing short-term risks and looking beyond the immediate planning horizon are, are equally essential approaches to maneuvering an organization through the uncertainties of the future. Dasha has a broad knowledge of both megatrends and societal development patterns. She co-wrote the report, The New Age of Trade, Trends and Drivers Shaping the World Economy, published in 2018. Dasha's experience lies primarily within economy, geopolitics, trade, risk management, climate, and environment. She also holds a master's in economics from the University of Copenhagen. From 2008 to 2018, and prior to joining the Institute, Dasha has held various positions, including head of enterprise risk management, economist, chief economist office with the Mulder Mars Group. And she also worked with Mars International Finance Program. Dasha was born and raised in the Soviet Union and came to Denmark at the age of 12 in 1993. She has experienced Russia before and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. This exposure has endowed Dasha with a natural curiosity in geopolitics and a nuanced perspective of the interplay in international relationships. She is the co-founder and organizer of the movement March for Science in Denmark which aims to underscore the importance of free and independent science for the development of society. With this in mind, Dasha hopes to contribute to raising the bar for societal debates 
and improving the extent to which these debates are anchored in facts. We are so very pleased that she could lead us today in this connector session. Her insights are sure to be invaluable to all of us. Uh, and thank you very much for the introduction. I mean, I sound both very interesting and very old <laughs> in terms of everything I've done, but I guess if we, um, if looking a little bit across this virtual room, it looks like we have a lot of very different pathways uh, here. We have different backgrounds uh, and not just the virtual ones, but also um, that all of us are coming from at the future from different directions. I am a trained economist, but I am also the boring one at the Institute and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but we are, um, we are a multidisciplinary think tank and we're quite old, uh, which means that we never say anything for certain. And that, I think that's probably one of the key things I will highlight today that the future is multiple. And I think without further ado, I'll jump in and see if the technology works uh, and I'll try and share my screen. There we go. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, hold on, I lost it myself. There we go. Still working? Absolutely. You're all okay, good. Okay, fine. Good. So, sorry. This is usually how these things start. So when we talk about the future, it always is a little bit of a hiccup with technology and usually on the user end. So I apologize for that. Nonetheless, um, we, when we translated ourselves into English a couple of years ago, um, we made a point of making sure that futures are plural. And this is why we call it the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. So this is not a typo, but this is to underline the fact that we do, um, we genuinely believe that the future is a multiple. And I'm sure that by the time we're done today, you will be fully on board as to why, why we think that. I've called the session for today, the future is a feature, not a bug. And it's a little bit provocative maybe, but what I mean by that is also that we very often uh, feel that uncertainty is uncomfortable. We fall prey to our own biases and I'll get into those later. We, we experience the future as something that is gonna happen to us, not with us. And we very often experience it as something we can't impact at all. So it's something, it's something to be dealt with by the time it gets here. And I hope when we leave this session today, you've, I've given you a few tools and some food for thought as to why that's not necessarily the case. We fully subscribe to the fact that it's, um, it is a feature and it's something that we can work with. And it off, very often, if we do that at the right time with the right tools, that it actually can play out to our benefit. Just very briefly about us, because we are far away, um, we have been around for 55 years, and I know that bragging with the past is a little bit counterintuitive when we're working with the future, but it's also, it also goes to say that the discipline we're working with is so robust that through time, it's only become more and more relevant. You're seeing more and more uh, organizations and companies engage in uh, establishing roles such as the future foresight officer, um, uh, they are looking at, uh, at whole divisions in which they want to explore this. So more and more we get engaged in actually equipping companies, uh, organizations, and just the general public in terms of how to work with the future, which is also why we've re uh, we've double clicked on our purpose. So for many years, it was put simply was just betterment for society, but increasingly, just like everybody else, we're being asked, what do we actually mean? What is a better society? And for us, a better society is one in which people can actually feel some agency in terms of imagining, working with, and shaping their own futures. So this is why we're here. We believe we're, we want to make sure that the future has a voice. And um, sometimes we, I mean, if we're on, on our activist days, we call it decolonizing the future. We wanna give it back to, uh, to the future and make sure that it's part of every conversation and policy. But it's also about enabling people and young people and, and decision makers in working proactively with the future rather than fearing that at some point it's going to hit them. So it's all about risk mitigation. It is not. We are also uh, currently engaged in something called teach the future. And this may sound funny, but I think increasingly we're looking at more and more reports that show that young people today are discouraged. Uh, they're looking into a dystopian narrative. So if you think about it, I mean, we've never really, not no generation before this one has been told the future will be worse than the past or the present. I know we've had crises, we've had wars, we had pandemics before, but somehow they came, they came often suddenly or just within a very short span of time. And then they peaked or, you know, they troughed at their um, atrocities and then, and then they kind of went away. 
and we we started rebuilding but now we're actually telling the story of a worse future whether it's a deglobalized world or more restrictions or omnipresent technology we can't control or the climate so we've never actually had a narrative that is worse than the present so if we're now seeing this future anxiety among young people so and in all fairness i mean we are probably the only creature on the planet at least as far as we know who can imagine things we've never seen um we can convey these things we can imagine to other people and if we're convincing enough we can make other people imagine things they've never seen either and the thing about the future is actually just the story we tell each other, right? It hasn't happened. It's not here. No one really knows what it looks like. So basically, it's a story we make up. And then the more convincing the, the narrator, the more convincing the messenger, well, the more people will actually get on board and with one particular future vision. And somehow we start working towards it. So, and I, I hope there's no historians in here. I have many colleagues who are historians, but in many ways, I mean, we know that history is subjective as well. So if we can teach history and this narrative about a past that we also often update and, and, and rewind, well, then one, why can't we teach future? So that's one of our, um, that, that's definitely one of our big agendas recently is that we also want to make sure that we get the future as, as, a, um, as a discipline into curriculum and to uh, giving us providing young people with agency as well so we want to teach the future but it doesn't stop with young people we also want to share the discipline wide um so this is why i'm here today um i have to say that i'm probably the most boring one at the institute so a little bit more about us not only are we 55 years old we're also completely independent we recently discovered that we're the oldest living think tank in denmark who's never received any public funding so basically, we have no vested interest in any particular future, but we want to make sure that we come at it from as many different angles as possible. And we do that by employing, so we're roughly 30 in between us, we have 18 different nationalities and roughly 19 different professional backgrounds. And this ranges from marine biologists and astrophysicists and um, psychologists, techno-anthropologists, philosophers, historians, etc., and all the way to boring economists like myself. So we never agree on anything. We come at the world and at our customers and, and our research and the future from so many different angles that it's an eclectic uh, playground of minds, which makes my job a little bit difficult because eventually I need people to somehow agree or I need to generate some sort of consensus for a decision. But other than that, it's an extremely interesting place to be because whenever we agree on something too soon uh we probably made the wrong decision and i'll get back to that as well we also believe that it's not only teaching the future and but it's also about challenging the existing narratives because if we look at what is currently out there and often it will be science fiction or ai generated images which then build up a database of science fiction or we have historic historical data for um uh in terms of societal roles and, and, and distributions so we have these dominant images of the futures, we, and we believe that foresight, futures literacy, future studies can actually challenge this poverty of imagination. So we actually can have a more uh, diverse view of what the future is and what it would look like. But I think before I, I kick off, uh, maybe I should give you a warning because I'm going to engage you guys throughout the session. So otherwise, it will be me talking for a good long hour and as much as that's great for me and interesting for you, it could also get a little bit monotonous. So you're not going to be off the hook in terms of this being an interactive session, although we're doing it in 2D and virtual. The first thing I want to do is I want to engage in a, um, in a small game with you. It's called the Polak game. And I don't know how many of you know it, but basically it means that I would like to understand where you guys stand in your view of the future. And there's going to be four quadrants. Um, and one of the axes will be I believe that the future is worse or it's better. And the other axis will be, I feel I can impact it or I feel I can, or I feel I can't. So do you feel you have agency to impact the future or do you feel it's going to, trans to transpire regardless of what you do? And do you feel that the future is better or worse? And I have given it the four quadrants some numbers. So basically take a second, consider where you are and just a show of hands, um, put some a few fingers in the air and show me which quadrant you guys believe you're in. We all have elements of all four quadrants in us. So this is just a, an, an interesting exercise for me to see where you guys stand. So please take a look and let me know where you are.
So a quick show of hands. You can just do it in your camera. What quadrant? Yeah, or the chat. Okay. Two point five. I like that. All right. Okay, I can see we have a nice. I see we have a nice distribution. There, there are still some more dominant, which is great. So I, I can see a lot of people actually in the uh, optimistic corner, saying they both can influence and feel it's going to be better. But we do have a distribution across all. Okay. Great, right, well, feel free to take this exercise with you to your organization or just around the dinner table and your friends and see where people actually stand in terms of the future. It's, um, so it's, it's something we often use as a small warm-up exercise and it's nice for me to know who's kind of in a room in terms of futures thinking. Um, the next small exercise I would also like for you to engage in and I, I just wanna say that um, I would love for you guys to volunteer and share some thoughts. The exercises I will have with me today are uh, basically just asking you to, to reflect a little bit on what foresight is a discipline, but also on what may, what assumptions you may be making about the future already. So they're completely harmless. So I would really encourage you to share. Um, I may just pick someone randomly though, but I do hope that you will raise your hand and then I will try and, and have a few of you share your thoughts. Um, and I do hope you guys want to engage with this as well. Now, the next small exercise, we call it a little bit of a mental, we're improving our mental flexibility. I want you to spend, so I'll give you two minutes and try and think uh, about these two questions. So let's go back 10 years. Um, and so we're standing in 2014 and looking back, what would you have expected to be here by now that has not occurred? And what do you find yourself in today that you didn't see coming? So just these two questions. What did you expect that didn't transpire? And what do we see around us today that you didn't expect just 10 years ago? And please raise a hand if you wanna share a few thoughts. All right, let's see, I already have a few volunteers. Um, Kaleen, you wanna go first? Sure, um, and I'm here just to kick start things off and jumpstart. I hope there's more interactions. I see there's other waiting, so I'll be quick. Uh, the one thing that I would have expected to see, and this comes out of my, uh, when we were in high school, we had a, a very brilliant PhD principal who told us that we'd all be flying around the world in small drones by the time we finished high school. And that was 1987. So I would have expected to see that in 2014 and it didn't happen, but there are drones of course, but this was the human version where we could, we could all fly around. Um, the thing that I didn't expect, and I'm just uh, forever um, impressed by its brilliance is uh, AI uh, and things like chat GTP. All right, I think Rebecca, you were up next. The first things that came to mind were definitely AI and even things like 3D printing. Like when I first heard about 3D printing, I was just shocked that it was even a real thing. Um, just didn't, and didn't anticipate those kind of things. But the thing that I- Rebecca, was... can you speak up a little bit? Cause we're having trouble hearing you. And I think we've lost you, Rebecca. Maybe give you a second to get your microphone. All right. Meanwhile, Nordan, you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Uh, with the Industry 4.0, I was expecting technology and automation getting faster and in the manufacturing and in other areas too. 
but I didn't expect jumping this quickly with the COVID in the last three, four years with the communication, the Zoom that we are doing and how we used to do our businesses, not being in the office anymore. Those were the things that I wouldn't imagine that we would be adapting that quickly or try to adapt that quickly and be part of our uh, regular life. So those were the two things. Expected the technology and automation, but not this fast. And yes, of course, AI is a big component of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I think before Rebecca dropped off, I heard, I think I heard something about 3D printing, something also a few technological advances. Justin. Absolutely. Sorry, my camera is not working. So sorry, you have to look at a black screen. Uh, apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> what what uh, didn't happen or hasn't happened that I really thought would happen is uh, I'm an architect by profession. And I really thought that you would see more advances in like how we build and construct things. Um, we have all this wonderful new technology, but still everything comes down to a person hammering a nail into a piece of wood in the year 2024, which seems a little bit ridiculous. Um, and the thing that um, I did not expect has been I would, what I would call like pandemic aftershocks. So not just the, the change in, um, yeah, the changes in how we work and how people are still, you know, I work in downtown Toronto and the, the downtown is still, you know, is still kind of empty and just all these sort of um, changes that have occurred in a, our society because of what we went through during the pandemic. I think that was not something I ever would have seen coming. And I think we're going to feel those consequences for a long time. All right, uh, Rebecca, you're back. I am back. Can have you another go? Can you hear me better now? Yes, perfect. Sorry, new headset just got two days ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, the things that haven't happened that I thought would happen, um, my background is in education, and I'm really surprised that we're still educating our students in the same way, like in rows, the way it's been since the Industrial Revolution. Um, the changes are coming really, really slow there. And I'm also really surprised by how slowly accessibility is moving forward, especially where I am in Ontario, Canada. You know, we had this whole thing that Ontario is supposed to be fully accessible by 2025. And it's like, that's six months away and we are not even close. It's gonna be six busy months. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, thanks. First of all, we're a little bit now we're a little bit warmed up. I hope you can feel it. So, you know, we're, mentally, we're now traveling a little bit back and forth in time, which is great. Uh, I can't help notice, which is very common, um, is that we technology takes up a lot of space in our thinking in terms of the future and be it future back of, or, or present forward, it doesn't matter. So technology has this prevalent role in when we discuss the future. Um, and it Technology is important, and especially now um, with AI, et cetera. I mean, with, but actually until recently or relatively recently until AI really made its, um, it, its entry, I would have gone as far as saying technology for me is mostly a, a force multiplier. Because if we really think about it, many, many technologies have basically not changed. So when I warn my kids about a car on the street, it's the same car that was invented 100 years ago, roughly, right? It's slightly different, slight difference in technology and speed, but other than that, I mean, it's pretty much the same object, and it does the same for us as it has for a century, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but I guess by now, I mean, already we have we have a little bit of a vector. I hope you can see that. That was my that was a little bit of a trick question. Is that if we if it also means that where we're standing right now, all of us, whatever you are imagining for the future, is probably not going to pan out exactly the way you're planning it. So if you know if you're building a strategy towards that, or you developing some sort of solution, service, product, whatever it is, it's extremely important to remember that whatever you're planning towards is likely going to shift right in front of you. And you need to, you need to look up, not just the movie, but do look up because your target future may be, may be shifting. And the other thing is also that, um, uh, that we've seen so many things surprise us, you know, the uncertainties that have come of course, the pandemic was big and it was a disruptor, but I mean, we've had other things enter the stage in the last 10 years as well. Everything from the you know, geopolitical discourse to, uh, to uh, biotech um, pushing the limits in terms of uh, you know, fertility and actually very private decisions, et cetera. So, so in many ways, now we have a vector, which means I hope by now I've proven the point that you should never plan towards one future, but at least multiple. And I'll get, now I'll get into a little bit how we do that. So thanks for 
playing along. I'll get back to you. You're again, your guys are not going to be off the hook until I'm done today. So, um, just a sec. Uh, going back to my, there we go. Okay. So how do we then work with the future? Well, first of all, you need to remember that um, this, even when you do, when, when you really stress your imagination, I mean, reality will surprise you. So next time someone says, hey, imagine if this or that happens, don't turn them down. I mean, try to entertain the idea and, and talk about what it would actually imply for society, for whatever it is you're engaging in, be it on a personal level, on a professional level. I mean, because as we've seen over the last 10 years, and this is just an example, I mean, reality has a tendency of surprising us. So at some point, facts became secondary to opinions and emotions and, you know, a natural instinct for science was enough to, um, to, to both convey and base policy and recommendations during a global pandemic. It was during the same pandemic that uh, one of the busiest probably um, uh, epidemiologists in the world that had actually, actually had to take out time in his busy schedule and rebuke something that was tweeted by a rapper in terms of vaccines, COVID and, and the disease. So he actually had to take out time to make sure that uh, Nicki Minaj was not treated as any sort of expert or authority just because she had a cousin and a friend who, uh, who had the vaccines and became impotent and something about a canceled wedding, et cetera. So when you try to imagine the future, try harder. As we just established, um, it is sometimes it is hard to conceive that things will be significantly different from we imagine, but if you take the present moment and go back, it's maybe a little bit easier, but of course there's a symmetry in that. So just looking around right now, just as you guys shared, I mean, the present moment used to be an unimaginable future and very recently actually. So for better or worse. And I think very often when I do these sessions or you know, I do a keynote, sometimes people come up to me and feel a little bit discouraged, which I would hate for anyone to walk away with because first of all, the future is neutral. And I know it doesn't sound like it sometimes when we talk about it, because when we look at the media, I mean, bad news sell, we should be concerned. There are many uh, issues to be solved, but there's also a lot of innovation and a lot of positive change. And if you look at factfulness with Hans Rosling, he will also show you that many of the objective parameters for humanity have improved over time. So unimaginable. And when I then ask people to, you know, to reflect on some of the things that surprise them, we very often come up with the risks or some of the more the less fortunate development. I think it's important to remember that the future is, is neutral and there's going to be a winners and losers in, in every scenario. So it's about being prepared and having the right conversations at the right time. I also know that we, we really like forecasts, at least people like me or anyone who's planning ahead, uh, be it for business or for personal reasons, we like forecasts. And it can be anything from weather forecasts to, uh, to financial planning, you know, estimates, et cetera. Now I've being an economist and spending 10 years in the corporate sector um, with Maersk, the shipping company who at that time, different industries, including oil and gas and retail and everything else, you know, I've done all of these models. And all I can say is that they're a false sense of certainty because you need forecasts, but we need more is the appreciation of the reality that means your forecast is wrong. The moment the number comes out of your model, or whatever it is, uh, whatever it is you're using, I mean, that number is wrong. Question is how much and in what direction? Um, can you still see my screen? Or are you seeing me? Okay, there we go. Um, and just, you know, on an anecdotal level, I don't know how many of you have, have read Taleb, but here's certainly a creature that knows everything about the danger of blind forecasts. So if you were a turkey and you lived for the first thousand years, a thousand days of your life and you lived happily, and, you know, every day someone would come in and feed you and interact with you and um, and you had a great day. Then when you woke up in the morning on day 1001, well, you were expecting your well-being to kind of continue. And you would expect the next day to be like the one before it, because we use historic data and historic assumptions when we do forecasts. Well, the problem is, if this is, hold on, I lost my screen. Okay, if you're looking at the turkey's well-being and this is day 1001 and it's thanksgiving well then then kind of the well-being goes to zero right and again this is a little bit of a drastic example and luckily in the real world things don't go as fast but truth is we very often expect the past to continue even if we can see it way ahead in time um we still refuse to adjust to the change that is actually coming and then we kind of respond as the turkey 
So what we have experienced is no matter what room you're in, what conversation you're having, the future is always important. I mean, you can't, no one would ever tell you that, yeah, it doesn't matter where we are 10 years from now. But, but the problem is, even though we all established that the future is important, what we also realize is it's never urgent. And there's a paradox in that, because if it's never urgent, but it's always important, it doesn't really make the agendas or the discussions. And it's always being pushed to being the last item you discuss. And somehow we're out of time. And then can we do it next time? And let's focus on the next quarter. And, and it's natural because, of course, there's tactical issues to, to be solved. But there are also, I mean, if we never reflect on what's going to happen 10 years from now, then we will, we will experience somewhat the Turkey situation. What it really, what the future also... Uh, one, one other thing that has this feature is things like uh, environment and, and climate. So the whole climate issue is always important. It has been important for decades, but that too has never really been urgent, not the way we've been treating it at least. So for now, at least two takeaways. The future is multiple. Don't plan for one. And if you really are discussing long-term implications of something, or if you're discussing your long-term, um, the well-being of your company or your idea, or, you know, where are you in 10 years, then make sure that it's also urgent and not just something you say to each other. Because if you don't make room for it, if you never have the conversation, then it's not that important after all. It's a little bit like that kid puzzle. You may Some of you guys may know it. If you're running a race and you're over, if you overtake the person running second, what number are you then? Well, you're still second. And that's what usually happens, happens to the future in conversations. You just remain second. Um, one way to then finally address the future and this could also be a segue into if you want to bring it up in conversations you could always ask people about megatrends i mean start with those so these are the tectonic plates they're on the move for 10 to 15 years they will impact the whole world um, but they're slow moving and sometimes i compare them to the sustainable development goals because when i joined maersk in 2008 and some of you may know the company some of you may not but it's the biggest shipping company in the world still based out of Denmark. Um, we knew everything about our business uh, and been around for more than hundred years. But when I joined, I was writing my thesis in the evenings. Uh, and my thesis back then was a very naive idea that I could solve climate change with game theory. So I was trying to write a mathematical model for solving the entire issue. Um, and I was doing that in the evenings at the office. And then one of my very senior colleagues came to me one evening and he said, what is it you do here every night? And I said, well, you know, I'm doing this thesis, it's climate. And he looked at me and he said, oh, Global warming, this is where the ice is going to melt and we're going to have more water to sail on. And, you know, this is 2008 and it's, it's not because we were a company that neglected the well-being of the world. I mean, it's actually a very environmentally conscious company in many ways. I mean, yes, they're in shipping, but if, if, if we look at what they're trying to do to minimize uh, the emissions, et cetera, they're actually quite at the forefront. But yet in 2008, this was the way they saw it because we didn't have a toolbox. I mean, sustainability was so many things. And at the same time, it was nothing. It was, you know, we, it was diversity in the workplace. It was global warming. It was um, environmental issues. It was everything at once. And no one really knew what to do with it. And then suddenly we get the sustainable development goals. And then suddenly everybody can work with it. So we find these, we have these 17 nice little pictograms. You know, we get a system for working with something that is so ambiguous and so intangible that suddenly it's a toolbox. The SDGs are imperfect. They're not equally important. And I know morally we have to say they are, but frankly, the fact that very few of us can mention all 17, some of us never learned or heard of all 17, that kind of says it all for me. I'm certainly one of them. I mean, I can mention a few, maybe if I really strain myself, more than half, but other than that, although I will say they're all equally important. We don't treat them the same. We don't talk about them the same. We don't allocate the same amount of time, research, money to the 17, but we can work with them. The same goes for the mega trends because often when people see them and I try to present them as a framework, especially if I do that, God forbid, to engineers uh, or accountants or anyone who's used to working with very exact uh, models for the world, they would challenge that they're imperfect. They're not equally distributed. They're correlated. Everything was wrong with them, except for it's worse not to have them. So this is for us a complete framework of uh, drivers we see out there for the external world, but they will have internal correlations and the like. Then you can argue, well, 10 to 15 years is a very long time. Uh, so what happens to them in this period? They're not just static and they're not. And this is why the next level of, of uh, dynamics we would meet usually is uncertainties. And these are the you know, the shorter term 
drivers um, and tendencies and dynamics that are pushing and pulling the megatrends in and out of their trajectories all the time. Sometimes the uncertainties get so powerful and get so much momentum that they actually shift a megatrend into a different path. And this is where we would revise the megatrends. Globalization is a good example. So up until recently, uh, we, um, we actually updated our megatrends in 21. We don't do that very often. And we, st we included globalization. And yet this is probably the megatrend that is the most challenged if you go to, I mean, if you read any newscast or if you um, any analysis on the global economy or conferences, et cetera, you can hardly go anywhere without deglobalization, decoupling, et cetera, being discussed. But globalization for now remains a megatrend and has all of these underlying uncertainties. And then last but not least, we have the unexpected events. And also Talib made this creature popular. Um, and this is the black swan, except there's a good reason why my swan is not black, but transparent. And I would like to defend them a little bit because I think we're confusing two very different creatures. I mean, the black swan and a scapegoat are two different species. And I think very often we're using the swans as a scapegoat for lack of preparation or lack of, um, I guess, emotional analytical acceptance of change. And then we we put it we bundle up and say we couldn't have seen this coming. Is the black swans do exist? For me, those are uh, these would be events where too many parameters ch change over too short a span of time for us to actually be able to connect the dots. But other than that, it's just pure lack of preparation or our inherent biases. And now to the biases. Um, I've made it a bit of a habit to make a bet with the audience, and this is a very safe bet because you guys are far away. So I'll I'll extend this to you as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about cognitive biases. And if any one of you doesn't recognize yourself in just at least one, uh, do write me an email afterwards and I will happily invite you for a drink if you're ever in Copenhagen. It can be any beverage of choice, everything from, from coffee to a beer. So just let me know. Again, this is a safer space considering most of you guys are far away, but I do mean it. So please stop by if you're ever in my neighborhood. So without further ado, Cognitive biases when it comes to the future. Well, the first one is change is bad for business, the status quo bias. Very often we respond emotionally in a situation where we should probably stop and think. And again, I, I fully subscribe to all of them, so don't be shy. But it basically means that when something changes in our immediate environment or external environment, it could be customers, policy, behavior of uh, stakeholders that matter to us, whatever it is. Rather than sit down and, and, and basically see what does it mean for us, very often we would, respect, we would respond with a status quo approach saying, everybody sit tight, the status quo is going to come back, everything will be like it used to, this is temporary, this is not serious, you know, so we lure ourselves into, into thinking that change is bad for business and maybe it's because going back to biology that, you know, change means investing energy and we need to conserve energy, I can't tell you I'm not a biologist, but the fact is we often respond with the status quo bias. Then at some point, so many things change that we can no longer ignore it and we start thinking what should we do about it. And then we go straight to the confirmation bias and say, hmm, when in doubt, let's go with what it used to work before, it's probably gonna work again. We disregard the fact that the circumstances are completely different. The issue may be completely different than, than previously, but we have this game plan, we pull it out of the drawer and we try to apply it in an environment that has nothing in common with the previous, uh, previous attempts. Then we have the very positive bias and it's an important one because this is where you have your innovation, entrepreneurship, some of these moonshot ideas and that's the optimism bias. Uh, it basically means that you get an idea that you perceive as being so good that it cannot possibly fail. Um, Technology is usually very prone to this, so this very this this uh, correlates very well with the Gardner Hyde cycle. That you know a lot of technologies are resting at the bottom of an optimism ocean, but it doesn't have to be a physical thing. It doesn't have to be a device. It could just be an example. Could be that I sit down with my management team and I consider myself a young leader and I try to come up with a talent program that should retain and attract some of the brilliant young people we want to attract in the future. And then I sit with my management team, who too are young leaders. You know, we're all in our early 40s and maybe even a little bit less and we say well this talent program is amazing if i was young again i would probably love to work here and then we fall in love with it so much that we not only design it but we basically roll it out only to realize that the young people of today feel and prioritize completely different from what i did when i was their age and basically this wonderful idea that couldn't possibly fail is met with with silence and no one is queuing up to work for us so again it could be anything it could also be 
inviting everybody for a barbecue and and um, including the vegetarians, but then only serving meat. So, you know, it could be tangible, it could be products, it could be plans, it could be a next headquarter, uh, it could be anything. Then we have the experts and experts are extremely important. And I assume looking in this little virtual space of ours, I assume that all of us are experts in something. Well, except me, now I'm a flexpert, which is a new world for generalists. Uh, so I spent many years of my life being an expert. Now I kind of I spread out a little bit, but a really good expert, if we're honest, uh, is someone who spends a lot of time and dedicates a big part of their life to becoming better and better at a more and more specific thing, right? So the better the expert to put it, I mean, to, maybe to exaggerate a little bit, is someone who knows virtually everything about virtually nothing. So we become very narrow. And experts are extremely important. But what is also important is that they don't know what they don't know meaning they and it's not their task it's basically you if you ask them for advice make sure that you remember what they're experts in because they will likely not suggest a solution outside their field of expertise and there is an anecdote and i don't know if it's true or not but the engineers of nasa were tasked with um, coming up with a ball pen that would work in zero gravity and you know they started spending the budget and employing um deploying all their brains and then someone was pass passed by and just said why don't you use my pencil so again, if you task engineers with something that could have an engineering solution, they're going to be looking for that because that's how they're trained. And I'm not saying experts are not important, not at all. But remember, they will not suggest something in which they're not trained. Then we have the group think fallacy. And this is usually very correlated with Friday afternoons. Um, it's also very well correlated with good weather because you want to go home, bad weather because you want to go home. So this is basically leaving a meeting. We have discussed something very complex like the future. And you leave with this very comfortable uh, sensation that you must have made the right decision in the room because you all agreed so quickly. Isn't it great that we all felt the same, thought the same? It must be the only right answer. Well, if it's about what you should have as a dress code for your next party, well, maybe that's a great solution and no reason to waste any more time. But if it's something as difficult as considering where the world is in 10 years or 15 years, well, and if you arrive at a decision too soon, then you need to ask yourself the questions of who's lying or who's missing. Because most likely there is already someone in the room who hasn't spoken their mind or someone is simply not there. So make sure to accept the challenge of people disagreeing with you because there is a disagree with you in that room and raise your awareness about other paths the future may take or there will be your opponent in the future and there will be an opponent of your, again, your idea, your product, whatever it is, you're trying to deploy in a future setting. So how are we doing for lining up to visit me? Is, do we, are we somewhat on the same page that most of us at times at least either have experienced it ourselves or been, been sitting across anyone in a meeting where this has been prevalent? Okay, and I guess that's another small, I see you guys nodding. Well, this is another small, um, uh, that's a life hack. So sometimes people ask me like, yeah, but you know, the session was great, but how do we tangibly then deploy some of this? Well, this is one thing you can do when you have one of these difficult meetings or you're heading into the middle of one or after it, go back and see, did we fall into any of these biases? Was there anything we skipped? Is there anywhere we just basically looked at each other and said, this is amazing. No one is going to challenge it. Whatever it was, go through this as a small checklist because that is already a good beginning. This is how we would suggest you work with the future instead. And this is a very simple tool, uh, the Futures Triangle. And very often when we are invited in, and I think it's fair to say that I've been on the customer side. So that's how I actually met the Institute. So working for Maersk for 10 years in different roles, uh, at some point I realized that our strategies are, you know, the classical strategies, there would be three to five year time horizons, but most of the assets that we had would either be vessels or port terminals, which are static, you know, they're basically highly exposed to not being able to, to go anywhere, um, oil rigs, whatever it was, we had assets that would be on our books for 20 years. And yet we were only looking five years out. So I actually, I met my predecessor during a keynote and I was so, I was blown away and intrigued by the way the Institute thinks and works and the fact that the, their future was nonlinear that I invited them in. And what we experienced then, me being on the customer side, and now I see it from, from, from my current role is that when, when a futurist enters a session, like, you know, the a nice, 
away day where you gather all of management or your whole organization and you go to a beautiful venue and the banner outside reads, where are we in 10 years or 15 years? And so everybody's keen on talking about the future, but when we enter the room, uh, there's some, something happens and everybody goes straight to the left, bottom left of the triangle. And that's where we start. So whether we like it or not, people are going to be very keen on discussing the present. They're going to be the, talking about what's on their minds, what difficulties do they, should they solve? You know, where are we going to be in three months? We're seeing this in this challenge. And that's perfectly fine because we, people need to get it off their chest. And then we would invite them to talk about the future at some point. And then something magical happens that we go straight to the right of the triangle, some sort of gravitational pull of discussing history. And then we go and we talk about everything we've tried, done, didn't do, work, didn't work, experiences from before, partners, leases, whatever it is, you know, the entire luggage of our history. History is important. I'm not going to tell you that, you know, just disregard it and just look out into the future. I mean, history is extremely important. It's our expertise. It's our values. Uh, it's our brand. Uh, it's our name. Uh, it's our culture, etc. But mentally, it's a very, very heavy anchor you drop into for futures day. So it becomes very difficult to disconnect people from the narrative they have and talk about the future. The good thing is, is it rarely becomes an issue because by the time we're done with the bottom of the triangle of this beautiful day in a beautiful venue somewhere, it's usually time for lunch, you know, the walk and talk, meet your colleague, Pilates on the lawn, whiskey tasting, and then see you all for dinner. And then the annual wheel says, remember, we discussed the future, but we never really did. So I would like to invite you guys to start from the top. So if you ever have one of these sessions and you actually make the future urgent and you put it on the agenda, we'll then start from the top. And the easiest way to do that is we're going to engage in a small science fiction exercise. Um, so let's just imagine... Imagine a child, your child, somebody else's, and imagine that child have your age right now. And then let's just this, imagine one day in their lives. Um, let's imagine it's a, uh, it's a Wednesday afternoon, or sorry, Wednesday morning, we'll start with the morning. So they wake up, um, and what do they wake up to? Do they have kids of their own? How many? Who did they have them with? Is it, you know... Did they have them with a partner, several partners? Did they have them by themselves? At what age did they have them? Do they live with the other partner, partners, co-parents? Do they own what they live in? Or do they rent? Or is it you know lifelong modular buildings? Let's say they have breakfast just like we do right now. Um, what's on their breakfast table? Do they have Kellogg's cornflakes? Did globalization continue so we have global brands everywhere? If they eat some sort of cereal, where was it grown? Does it have GMO? What do we put on it? Is it still milk? Do we have dairy, animal protein, cheese, butter? Let's assume that kids are as they've always been, that they change their mind 11 times before we're done with breakfast. So we end up throwing away half that cereal. Um, and then you have a, you know, you have a ticker going off on the wall saying you have now wasted 72 grams of cereal. Your carbon credit for the day is reduced. Your car will not open. But wait a minute. Do they have a car? Do they own a car? Do they have a vehicle standing in the driveway with a room for five people in which they can be stuck alone in traffic together with everybody else driving around with a room for five people? Do they even have to go anywhere? Are they going to work? Do they go physically into an office? If they do, then why? What is it we're trying to, what, what, what purpose does it serve going into a physical location rather than probably going into a virtual space? What energy powers whatever vehicle or mode of transportation that took them to this place? What time of day do they go? So because if the city is no longer serviced, previously they were industrialized, centers right then they became offices now that office work is moving towards remote then where do people live i mean do they have to live in the proximity of a city if not then what is it what what purpose do cities then fulfill it has it become recreational spaces but let's assume they do go to some sort of office because people still want to be together what do they do for work if they're in services, what services are needed? If they're producing something, what do the supply chain value chains of the future look like? What products are part of people's everyday lives? If they go to city hall and they're in public administration, then what are the topics on their agenda? What worries us in this, on this one day in their lives? What is on the public 
challenge list or issues? What is it we're dealing with? Well, I guess eventually they're going to go home and, you know, pick up their kids from wherever they outsource them to so they can pay this person while they go to work and stay away from the kids and whatever it is we do. But, you know, so this was just one day in their lives. So unless you can place your product, your company, your next headquarter, whatever it is in this future and genuinely believe that someone needs it, or you can imagine where during the day do they engage with whatever it is you guys are, are working with. Well, the future is not going to bend just for you. So you need to make sure that whatever narrative you have for that one day in their lives, that you're planning to be relevant and stress test your current relevance against that. And the funny thing is, this is a very, this is a very harmless exercise. You can engage your whole management team or who, partners, whoever it is you need to convince in this exercise, because it doesn't oblige you to do anything. It's so far away, but it, it does strike a note because I may have told you a story of someone's day but I've made some very hardcore mega trend and uncertainty assumptions. I've talked about biotech, about fertility, about demographics. I've talked about the health system, mobility, energy transition, urbanization, economic assumptions, global, uh, globalization and trade, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in this small story, I've addressed so many different mega trends and I've made certain assumptions. And it's a very interesting way to try and map your future relevance towards something like this. The good news is someone also did this exercise for you already. So back in 1950, uh, someone was tasked with developing a picture for the future. So we call this uh, future family. And the future family is depicted five decades away in time. So this is someone who did this in 1950, was imagining the life of an, Amer an American family in the year 2000. And this is quite, so this is imagining your grandchildren having your age right now. This is quite impressive. Because um, if we look at it, I mean, you, I guess you, very quickly, you would notice something that looks like an iPad on the right and no wiring, it's completely wireless and it's in real time. And we have a flat screen TV in color in the privacy of a home. We may not notice it today, but the floor to ceiling windows were unthinkable because you would never let someone into your life like that at the time. So some of my young colleagues noticed a lot of commercial airlines. Again, not a common thing back in the 1950s. A microwave, I, I believe the article says it has dust-free floors. Um, I must admit looking around my office, I don't have that yet. But this is quite an imagination, right? Um, we have a helicopter on the roof. And then interestingly enough, we have dad coming home from work and we have mom in the kitchen and we have the grandfather smoking right next to the kids. So somehow, and this is why I started out saying technology is a force multiplier. Yes, the imagination of whoever did this is quite impressive, right? Because the, the, we're imagining devices and means of communication and, uh, and home appliances that were unthinkable back then. So, wow. But at the same time, the softer fabric of this family, whatever, whatever is changing the dynamics between the, the people who inhabit this home, we have kept steady. So amazingly enough, we just, someone who did this decided that the social structures would remain unchanged. We're just going to drizzle a lot of technology on top of it. You can argue that it's in, in many ways, it's, it's a benign uh, misconception because we have time to adjust. But if you are a city planner, if you're sitting at that imaginary city hall in 1950 and you look at this, you're going to plan whole towns, roads, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, et cetera, around the assumption that this is what their everyday life is going to look like. You're not going to assume two parents going to work, so your high road, your highways will not necessarily accommodate the needed traffic. You will create the urban environment somehow adjusted to the fact that mom is going to be close, et cetera, et cetera. So as harmless as it may seem, we often undervalue and underestimate the social, the, you know, the, the non-technological elements that end up a little bit like a glacier that end up actually shaping the future. The fact that she went to work has given us the she economy. So the female purchasing power is bigger than the GDP of China. And yet here, she's still in the kitchen. So next time you discuss the future, which is, and this is taking me a little bit back to the mega trends, which I'll share with you um, in a little bit. It's again, one checklist could be the biases. The other checklist could be go around the mega trends because I'm, they may not be equally weighted, but they're all, they're all important. So unless you can stress test against them all, well, then you're, you're, engaging a little bit of wishful thinking right um i don't have to tell you that the future and time is not really linear i mean anyone who's you know waited for their luggage 
uh, or watch their favorite TV show will know that time is elastic, both in our perception, but also uh, but also in the real world sometimes. But we sometimes the disruptions are a little bit even, even less linear. So I'll, I'll be giving a few unfair examples, but I believe they strike a point. So bear with me. Um, here's a bridge in Honduras that was built in the 1990s. And it was built by a Japanese um, engineering firm. And they did everything, you know, by the book. Basically, these were the experts. So they test, stress tested the materials, they simulated all sorts of shocks, and then eventually they built the bridge. And then just a few years later, it was actually tested by a typhoon, a very heavy typhoon. And to their great comfort, they could go to the site of the bridge and establish that the construction with actually withstood the weather. The problem was that the river moved. I'm not sure if this is a super fair example and can you plan bridges for rivers that are moving? But fact is, I mean, maybe now with the extreme fluctuations in weather, maybe we should be building modular bridges. But my point is also that most organizations are actually busy building bridges to cross rivers that are already moving. We simply neglect the notion of something being on the move, you know, this, the status quo, sorry, the status quo bias that we're so busy building. It can, again, it could be any... It could be a plan we're rolling out. It could be something that has already been approved by the board or an investment committee, or we have the blueprint. So we're so busy building that we don't stop to check if the river is still there. And most importantly, what are the drivers of the river? So basically, we're making decisions today based on yesterday about tomorrow, and we don't stop to look. And here's going to be a very nice drawing, hand-drawn by me. Uh, so this is my next canvas for you. And with this one, I'll just give you, I will not ask you to share uh, your thoughts, but I'll just ask you to maybe spend a few minutes and reflect on what bridges are you guys busy building already or have built? And what is shaping the rivers that you're trying to cross? What are the drivers that are gonna be changing the issue or are changing the opportunity you're trying to grasp while you're still busy rolling out your plan? So I'll just give you a few minutes to reflect and then I'll, I'll continue. All right, I can see some of you also shared a few things in the chat. Um, and I look forward to read it a little bit later. Right, so um, I guess the next things I would like to, to share with you is my notion or my idea that, uh, you know, the, the saying that the devil is in the, in the details. Well, I've reworded it a little bit and I think the devil is actually in the assumptions. And uh, hold on, there we go. Um, just a second, there. Um, so, uh, if, and I'll give you an example. So we, if we look at 1961 and we had the first person going to space, right? So the first human went into orbit and came back alive and it was a, an engineering, um, achievement like we hadn't seen in a long time. So everyone was, um, basically everyone was amazed and then what happened afterwards is that we continued to invest heavily. So I actually looked up NASA's uh, budget. And in real terms, I think back in the 60s, it was $50 billion. And then in the 70s, it dropped to $25 billion, And it's roughly stayed stable since. So, you know, a lot of money is pouring into this. We have an ideological face-off between the East and the West, Soviet Union and, and the U.S., you know, capitalism versus um, communism or socialism. So there is a lot at stake, not only... A prestige, but also what was perceived as a security threat back then. So the space race is on. Then we um, we uh, educate and pour in more engineering minds. We have more satellites in space. And then only eight years later, we have humans landing on the moon. And just imagine what this means. I mean, just in eight years, we went from, from having the first person in orbit to having the first uh, person standing on the moon on an extraterrestrial had I been tasked back then, uh, being the economist that I am saying, Dasha, where do you think we're going to be in 2000? I would say, hmm, you know what, if we can do this in eight, I think in 30 years, we're going to be on Mars. And I would advise everyone to invest in a little piece of real estate on Mars uh, or a little, bit piece, a little piece of land because, you know, prices are low, sunsets are great. So that would be a given. The problem is I would be assuming many things. So I would be stacking up all of these pillars that support my future narrative assuming for them to come true. What really happened was it didn't continue. Um, 
Soviet Union collapsed and it actually, rather than landing on Mars, it gave us who was then called uh, the last Soviet citizen. So this is a gentleman who was stuck in space for three months longer than he should have because the country he left ceased to exist and the country he was supposed to return to failed to pick him up. Um, yeah, plot on the moon, I can see that. Um, so basically everything I was assuming to be true fell away. I mean, as I said, NASA lost their funding because now they kind of landed on the moon. The Soviets were going nowhere. So rather than actually go to Mars, we haven't been back for 50 years. And just let that sink in. What does it mean? So the Russians, they sent up a, um, a lunar vehicle last year and it crashed into the surface. That was Luna 25. That was the name of the vehicle. Luna 24 was in the 70s. So not only did this exponential development not continue, but it basically came to a complete halt. So for 50 years, we didn't go back to the moon. And I'm not saying space exploration hasn't continued. Of course it has, but the actual extraterrestrial visits, landings on the moon and going to Mars, I mean, all of that actually came to a halt for 50 years. So next time you're uh, discussing a strategy or you know putting a dot on the wall, this is where we're going. It's The dot is important, but what is more important is park that and discuss what needs to be true. So ask yourself the question, what needs to be true in the external world for this idea to succeed? Not what we need to do internally, how many people we need to employ, where we need to put our next headquarter, what systems we need to onboard, et cetera. I mean, you'll get to that. But take a minute and discuss what needs to be true for this to succeed. Because very often you would realize, and as we did, so the first time I had this high experience was when I was with Maersk. And we were, we were engaging with the Institute for, um, for our strategic process. And, and mind you, I mean, it's a company of 100. And back then, it was 110,000 people. And again, being the world leader in their, in their business, we knew everything about the sector and the industry. And we'd come up with this brilliant strategy. And then along came the Institute, and they challenged us. Um, and basically, what came out of the analysis was that for our strategy to succeed, we had assumed 10 things. 10 things to go our way. Out of the 10, we could control two. We could uh, predict the direction of four. And then the remaining four, we couldn't predict or we couldn't control. And I remember that was met with a deep, deep silence in the room with some of the most senior stakeholders we had because it was a very humble experience to see that we had assumed so much about the world that had to go our way that we completely forgot to at least tag it for the uncertainty that it is and the external factor that it is. And we certainly would not be revisiting it had we not had this conversation with, with, with the futurists. Because that's what we often do. We assume many things and then we kind of move on to see how do we then act on it. So next time you're in that room, ask yourself what needs to be true. And not just um, on the enabler side. So we often call it the power struggle of the future. And this is where we have the friction field um, between the drivers and the turners and blockers. So the drivers and enablers, this is, th those are all the things that are working for you. That's what gave you the idea in the first place usually, right? This is, that, that this is what drives the optimism bias, that you look to the left side and you establish that my idea is amazing and there's so many things working for me. What people often do is that they forget the right side and they don't even have to balance out. You can have so much going for you on the left and all it takes is one thing on the right and the outcome may be net negative for you. Uh, so it's a, I, sometimes I describe the right side as the, the Lego brick, the tiny Lego brick on your living room floor at night that you step on. All it takes is one and the pain is immense. I, my last role with Maersk was heading up the enterprise risk team. And when I left or, you know, as I was having my farewell reception, one of the speeches jokingly mentioned that behind our backs, my team had been called the business preventing office. And I realized that that was probably fun to them, but I thought it was such a shame because actually what we did, we weren't there to prevent business. I mean, if you can't mitigate your way out of possibilities because you have to take a risk, but it was about making informed decisions. So next time you're in that room, I mean, do talk about all the drivers and enablers, but make an effort to discuss or everybody list at least one, two things that could kill this idea. And they don't have to be probable and they don't have to be eminent, but very often you would realize that actually First of all, you'll imagine them um, much easier than you thought. Uh, and the second thing that will happen is you will, you will likely list more than three. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't go ahead with the idea, but it basically means that at least you're going to walk into this with an informed state of mind.
Right. And I think I had, I, th I think I had an example for at least for Denmark. So we have relatively stable public transportation. We have congested roads, despite the fact that we have 200% tax on all cars. We have expensive public transportation. And then suddenly we get the phone and we get an app and you could make use of all the idle assets. And, you know, Uber is really on the rise and everybody thinks this gets a great idea. Um, the problem is there was just one thing on the right that they miss, the taxi drivers. And then actually the net, if, the net outcome was that we don't have Uber in Denmark at all. So again, a lot of things going for them on the left very few things on the right and still it was enough because i'm gonna and i'm gonna hammer a little bit on this point of assumptions um and i know that blockbuster is tired of seeing themselves on on my slides but frankly there's a good reason they're there so i'll just use the example anyway um let's assume that they as like any other company they wanted to maintain and grow their market share and they were assuming you know, people are going to watch more entertainment in the privacy of their home there will be a push for uh, inf influencing the entertainment that you're being exposed to and not necessarily being uh, exposed to flow TV. We don't want to clutter our homes, so we want to rent more and own less. And then last but not least, they could have assumed, I'm pretending to have been a fly on the wall, I'm probably not entirely right, but you know, if they assumed that it would all remain a physical technology, well, all they had to miss was one assumption and the domino, domino stopped falling in their direction. So. What I can assure you 100% is that in none of these companies, and I could add you know, the Codex and the rest of them to the list, in none of these companies did they sit around uh, in a room with the best uh, sector knowledge, with all the weight of the shareholders and stakeholders on their, on their shoulders, the biggest market share ever. And then they had a board meeting and they said, hmm, how about we become uh, synonymous with complete strategic failure and we do that within the next five years. And then everybody will be like, yeah, that's an amazing idea. That did not happen. So somewhere in these rooms, the smartest people with the biggest experience, the most knowledge about their industries, they still fail to imagine what needs to be true or at least to vigilantly watch it for when the change start to occur. Because none of these things, this is not a Turkey situation. Um, I think many of some of the things that did hit them eventually they could have seen coming and actually I know for a fact that there are internal documents with many of them flagging these things except a new leader would come in and they would dismiss it because of their gut feeling whether it's one of the five biases or we should add gut feeling as a sixth bias I can't tell so all right now it's a little bit your time to work so I will give you another say two minutes three minutes to contemplate what could be on here for you so it could be again it could be a personal goal or it could be a professional goal it could be a company goal but what is it you're already assuming what dominoes are you already assuming going to stack up exactly as you want them and they're actually external factors that you can't control and then i'll ask if maybe a couple of you to share um and then i'll slowly start to to round off so two minutes and then i would love to hear a couple of you share what you put down All right, does anyone want to share a few thoughts? Again, it could be anything. I'll even give you an example. So um, when I did this with the procurement team of Procter & Gamble, they suddenly realized that their entire sustainability strategy rested on a external vendor not appointing the next CEO to be male. So... And that's a little bit hard to, that, that is a little bit hard to control and influence. Do we have a volunteer? And it's okay if not. Yeah, Livia. Yeah, happy to share. Um, I, so I'm currently, I'm working at a post-secondary uh, institution and trying to build a, a one day summit or conference for some second year students. Um, and in like thinking about it, some of the assumptions that I'm making is that there will be interest, that there'll actually be interest from the student population, that there'll be um, interest from stakeholders I'm hoping to involve in actually facilitating this conference, that there'll be alignment amongst the stakeholders um, around like topics that we're hoping to facilitate. And I'm also assuming, I'm assuming that 
will be able to do this on a very low and limited budget. Okay. Yeah. And how many of those can you actually influence? Probably one. I'd say the <laughs> alignment. <laughs> I'd say the alignment amongst like the stakeholders, um, I think I can control to some extent by like by facilitating conversations, understanding everyone's priorities. And I think coming to sort of a common ground on the topics that we think could, yeah, could I guess hit on all the objectives. All right. Like, and I mean, oftentimes we'll find that there's nothing we can do about it, but as long as, as long as we're not assuming that all of those things align, Mm -hmm. basically the way we want them then i think it's, it's already a far more um, informed process mm -hmm. right i think i'll just i'll leave you guys with the canvas in your minds and then feel free to, to use it and i think i'll just share one last i don't know if i stop sharing or i'll just try again um so i promised to do the mega trends and share them with you and i and i will now um because i can see that i'm running a little bit short on time so i'll straight go straight to those so again so i mean if some of them don't surprise you, that's the whole point. But otherwise, I'll just give you the 15 that we work with. And so when we look at the world, we've grouped them the following way. So we have globalization, the one I already mentioned. We have population growth. We have environmental change and sustainability. And I think especially population growth and environmental change, those are the two underlining the fact that things will not be equally distributed, right? So we're going to have the north and southern hemisphere differences, etc. Then people in society, we have an aging world, and that actually goes across the globe, except we have to remember, which is something my health colleagues alluded me to, it's uh, alerted me to, it's the world is aging, and it's, it's a parallel shift, but the nations that have been the oldest re are remaining the oldest. So basically, it's a parallel shift. And a funny thing is, it seems that it's a distribution that is moving to a little bit to becoming steeper, because their point was that the oldest person has actually not aged much. And that's an interesting notion, right? That we're kind of, we're just skewing the distribution. We're all living longer and longer. I'm not saying it's going to be the turkey effect for all of us, but we haven't actually cracked, uh, cracked the nut in terms of um, longevity as such. Then we have individualization and empowerment. And this is everything from hashtag activism to uh, the fact that I leave so many traces on the internet before I enter a store, if I ever enter one physically, is that I expect people to treat me as a psychographic and not a demographic. I'm not just an income bracket and a social status, married or divorced. I'm someone who cares about animals and, you know, I have a favorite color and I've been to these places where I checked in online. So actually, I think there's a statistic saying that within, I think, roughly 13 clicks on Facebook, I think, with, and it, it provides an 83% accuracy on your uh, sexual orientation. So I think, I mean, by the time I come to the office, especially I've been into, if I've been into public transportation, I've left so many breadcrumbs telling you who I am that I, I expect to be treated as an individual. Then focus on health. Uh, and one good way to check it is follow the money. I mean, the health industry is, is, is booming, uh, everything from wellness uh, to mental health, urbanization, of course. And then, as I said previously, I would talk relatively little about AI and automation primarily from, I would basically usually address it from the point of view of the labor market and what does it mean if we deploy too much automation too soon. But now, of course, over the last two years, I mean, AI has become a force to be reckoned with. And coupling that with the biotech revolution, I'm currently reading Mustafa Suleiman's The Coming Wave. I can highly recommend it. In a couple of months, it's probably going to be too old <laughs> or outdated. But, and he's the, he's the gentleman behind Deep Minds. So some of you may have heard this example where an algorithm beat um, a, a, the world champion, the human world champion in a very complex game called Go. So he's the man behind AlphaGo. And now he's just been employed as Microsoft's head of AI, consumer AI in any event. So he's actually, he's actually a, a big tech supporter and a big tech enthusiast, except now he's actually propagating that um, there is a pessimism aversion in anyone, in most people working with tech, which means they're not willing to engage in the conversation of the what if, what if, things don't go the way we want them to. And he's now trying to make that point that the, the biotech revolution, the AI revolution happening at once is such a potent um, mix that it can do, it could change the world for the better, but it certainly should be done with our eyes open. Then we have interconnectedness and engineering advances. And then last but not least, all the economic trends. You may you know, recognize network, society, service, um, economic growth, but one that isn't, we added last time, we rarely, 
take away anything or add anything, but we did that the last time, concentration of wealth. And here we don't necessarily just mean the Gini coefficient, right? So it's not necessarily the inequality uh, in a nation. It's also inequality between nations, but more than that, it's the fact that we now have economic agents such as big corporates um, also coming out of the fourth industrial revolution and because we don't know how to tax tech yet, not, not really. We have concentration of wealth in agents that will be agenda setting that are already transcending um, lim uh, basically uh, national borders, continents. You know, they're they're, there's industry slipping, so they're, we, we can't tell one industry from another because it's penetrating everything. And yet they're not part of any of the formal institutional frameworks. So we now have, we, we have companies that have uh, revenues bigger than GDPs of whole nations. And yet they're not really, not in a structural manner part of the conversation, but they will be agenda setting. And an example for me could be when we did go to space last year with a Danish astronaut for the first time, it, was, it wasn't, uh, ESA was actually, bar, they, they were um, piggybacking on SpaceX. So it was a private company who was sending an ESA astronaut to space. And by the time Starlink is, is finished, uh, Elon Musk is going to have more satellites in orbit than any other nation. And that just says something about where the corporates are today. It's not necessarily a bad thing because again, change happens faster in the private sector, but it is a force to be reckoned with. And we have absolutely no, I mean, we don't have sufficient room nor, um, nor institutions to deal with it yet. So concentration of wealth is a big topic. And just an example, as I said, never use one in isolation. I don't, know, I don't mean to be, you know, hindsight or everything looks clear in the rear view mirror, but if we took the fact that we are getting richer, so more and more people uh, enter the middle class. They, it's a globalized world, so they spend a lot of that money to travel. We have population growth, so we have more people moving into the middle class. They're also getting older. As I said, everybody's getting older, and yet we live in cramped cities, and we still consume animal protein, so we're close to animals. And 70% of all diseases, I, as far as I know, go from animals to people. So if you combine those, well, suddenly maybe COVID was not a black swan. I'm not here to say we saw COVID coming. We wrote about a different pandemic in, in, in a futuristic scenario. But the fact is, having com combining these gives you a completely different perspective than only looking at one in isolation. So do yourself a favor and, and use these a little bit of as, as a Rubik's Cube or a kaleidoscope and see, given the different combinations, what do they actually look like? And I think with that, I will actually end because I'm almost out of time. And if you guys would like to ask questions or just comments, I'll welcome it very much. So I will stop sharing. Thank you for sticking with me. I know it's it's a long session. Well, it's evening here, but still it's uh, 2D is a hard way to start your day. So thanks for, for sticking it out. If we could all clap, we would, Dasha. Thank you. That was very intriguing. Um, super interesting. You can see the comments. People are alive in here. And I am going to, um, I, I think it goes without saying that you have intrigued us. Um, it was such a wonderful talk and so thought provoking, but I do see that some people have up their hands. So, um, please, um, oh, they, they, were, they were clapping their hands. Sorry. Uh, but, um, we have a few minutes, uh, three to four minutes, maybe even a little bit more for some questions. So if anybody has a question for Dasha. Uh, AJ, um, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Uh, very little, but we can. Maybe speak up a little more. Okay, sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you again uh, to all the organizers. And um, again, thank you, Dasha, for giving such a great um, insight. I think a few minutes where it went, we just didn't even, even know. Uh, the presentation was very encouraging and knowledgeable. A um, couple of things. One is, um, what is the next steps, if you may take as a takeaway for us as an audience? What What is the next steps? I know the goal was one good slide for us to look at. Is there any other way we could continue this engagement and also conversation on the next steps, especially on the mega trends, what you actually highlighted, as well as the last slide? I just wanted to see what we could do as a continuity from here on. Thank you. Um, now, I'm not sure if the question means, in, I mean, in, connect, in, in relation to the Institute or internally in your own organizations, I think I will share, I can see there's also a question if I'll share the slide deck and I happily will. I'll just share it with the organizers and they will distribute. Um, well, I think if you, if I'll answer in two, in two parts, if, if in terms of taking it home with you, I think 
I would probably take out some of the key points if you need to convince someone in your organization who hasn't heard this session. I mean, try and give them the biases or uh, the, um, the the futures triangle exercise or the megatrends. So, I mean, some I think some of these tools are very well applicable in uh, in a slightly playful but very serious setting. So it can have a very um, it can have a very serious implication in terms of the dialogue you have. So I would probably do that in terms of engaging with foresight in general. I think we're not, I mean, of course, I would love if you guys all came to our, uh, to our office or to at least visit at our website, et cetera, and, and, and subscribe to some of the stuff that we do. Um, because I do think they're a great asset in, in doing this um, proactively and, and, and engage with it in a tangible way, but otherwise find someone similar to us practitioners and try and deploy this as a tool basically. Um, because it, it, I didn't bring it for you because you know I had enough data in here. But uh, there's a clear, there's a clear survey showing that the companies who engage in foresight in a vigilant manner, which means they balance the short-term tactics with the long-term thinking, they actually perform better on financial metrics. This is not a nice to have. This is not about having a, a fun afternoon with your colleagues discussing science fiction. This is actual business. So if you look at bottom lines and market caps. Um, the companies who engage in this in a structured manner are actually better performers in terms of financial metrics as well. So I would probably try and take this very, very seriously and, and try and deploy it internally to the extent possible. A little bit of a shout out to Western Research Parks too. We've just updated our website. We are on LinkedIn um, under Western Research Parks. I've shared that. For these and more interesting upcoming sessions and those sessions that we have in person and networking, uh, please join us. Uh, this has been great. I am very conscious of people's time. I wanna make sure we stay on time, uh, but I always know it's a great session when you don't want it to end and, and there's continuous things. And, and so it's, it's made me think about all the things that we can do here in London, uh, Ontario, Canada, and how we can uh, form our future and, and be cautious of how we form it with respect to science and technology parks. So thank you, Dasha. Thank you to the audience who have been engaging and very attentive. And uh, we are very uh, happy that this session happened today. Um, we will sign off. Please feel free to follow up um, with any of us. I'd like to thank um, my staff for organizing this. Uh, most of them are online, Julia, Jen, Sarah, and others who, who work behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, and Dasha, we saw you in Luxembourg last year and you impressed us and you've equally done the same thing today. So thank you. My pleasure. Okay, have a great afternoon, everybody, and a great evening, Dasha. Thank you, you too. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.